it's brilliant that there's a thing there, a workshop thing on scenes, because that's what I, I suppose the other side of it is. I've made my living out of that since, since about 1992. It is kind of possible. And I've been doing fanzines since the middle of the 80s. And then we start, I've started with music fanzines. And then I think, as David will testify, if you try to sell a music fanzine and there's 20 people there and 15 of them have only got enough money to go to the bar, then you have to like put up with quite a bit of a stick. Whereas if you go to the football match and there might be 15,000, you've probably got a better percentage, better chance. And at the end of the uh, 1980s, there was like a fan movement in football and uh, lots of people, uh, there was a lot of uh, fans were sort of treated as like public enemy number one, even though it was their sport. And um, lots of people who did punk fanzines moved across and did football fanzines. And uh, it was like, it happened almost overnight. Every, every club, 92 clubs in the, in the league, each club had one or two fanzines. And maybe three or four. So in some cases it was like really, really quick. And uh, Middles was one of the last to do it. Uh, and I was beaten to it by two fanzines. But eventually, I uh, started writing for one of them, and then, and then about 1992, started editing. And 1994, I took over uh, when I was able to hear the bailiffs that had come to, uh, <laughs> they were knocking at the door. I, I presented the money, and then, and then quickly knocked up uh, on that typewriter, knocked up like a, a little sort of contract where, the, in return for me paying the bailiffs, the fancy became mine. <laughs> and, uh, it was, a, it was a, that's it, that's how we do it, you got, you know, <laughs> you got me in the, right, in the right place. But in, in those days when we did it, um, there, was no, um, there was no PCs, and my friends uh, who were in the office next to where I work now uh, had a desktop system which cost over £10,000, and it was massive, and it was the only one around, and uh, it, was, it was just like, it was almost like a bona fide typewriter, really. Um, but if you wanted to typeset anything and get anything printed, you had to pay a typesetter and you had to pay him a lot of money. So we used to use those typewriters, those Canon things, uh, take the ribbons out, put um, thermal paper, which is fax, fax paper in them, and um, it gave you a, a black on white, and you could take that to a printer and, and you could get it printed. But if you tried to get it printed off a normal typewriter, then um, the results were terrible. You couldn't read most of the writing and stuff like that. So things have moved so much, it's unbelievable. Uh, and we, we made a big mistake when we started the fanzine. We thought that every football fanzine came out every week, but in fact, most of them came out once a season. So pretty, because of that accident, had to do it as a job, because, it was in, because in those days, everyone would give you stuff to, to type. Well, give you, stuff, give you stuff handwritten to type. So it would take you two weeks between matches to actually type everything, especially when you could only type like <laughs> that sort of thing on a typewriter. Uh, and but now, obviously, it's just unbelievable how everything has changed because now um, you get everything the night before by email. You don't have to type anything, but then you've got to spend all night putting it together. You all know about those sort of deadlines, and, um, and it's just like everyone doing homework. Everyone gives it in really, really late. But I used to do some music things first before I did um, the fancy, and that's how I was able to uh, take my chance. I used to do, um, it was called Ket, which in those days meant sweets. <laughs> uh, it doesn't now, does it? And then, um, just, so this was my first one, it was just like white paper. And I had a friend who did like some designing for me. And he was just start, started up on his own as well. Um, and it's all done that typewriter. But it was printed. We did print um, a couple of thousand, I think. Maybe it was one. But maybe I told the advertisement it was a couple of thousand. It was actually a thousand. It's possible. Uh, give it out free, because that was the other thing, wasn't it? About um, as I said, if you go to go to gigs, and people are not really into um, paying for things. So give it out free and, and try to make money with, with uh, adverts. Try it for a, a year and a half, and it was appalling at it. So I could do I could do the information, but I couldn't get adverts. It was, it's, it's not, not really boring looking at actually now because there's hardly any illustrations. And of course, we had no scanners. 
So if you wanted to, as we used to do with the fancy, we used to buy old programs, which are probably quite valuable, and then cut the pictures out and stick them down and get them printed. Uh, I've got loads of old middle school programs with, with uh, holes in them. And um, we also have like books with holes in them and stuff like that as well. We could, and every now and again, we'd have like a get dark, somebody would have a dark room, and they would be able to actually do half tones of photographs. And we would use the half tone as, as, a, as an image for the cover or whatever we were doing. Or we, um, the early fanzines where a friend who was a graphic artist and he would, he would provide the covers. Uh, sometimes they would be, he'd do them himself and give them, he'd give them the printer rather than us, and then he'd realise that uh, you've got a really embarrassing cover on the fanzine that nobody has seen other than the uh, graphic artist, which has got us into trouble a couple of times. And uh, as you spend all the whole Friday night putting them together, you're, you're regretting it. That's very good. Okay, just do some um, questions. Like, um, what's, what's, what's the first like zine or, that you ever saw? What's the first one you actually saw? Well, on TV, didn't, in the 70s, in, in, um, there was like various programs about punk rock and there was something called Shy Talk. And, um, and a few others, like the like, innuendo names. Uh, and then they didn't all come to this area, really, because punk was a bit late coming here. It, when, it, when it came here, it was already finished in London, really. <laughs> But um, the Rock Garden used people used to have fanzines there, and then in the in the early eighties there was quite a few different fanzines came and went in the area, uh, like you know two just two or three issues that would be printed up, and and then there was just masses of football ones, and I just used to sit down and just write articles for those football fanzines, just the most obscure thing you could think of. You no know, idea where they were ever printed because they never get back in touch with you, but I think some of them might have been, uh, and then I. Used to write for When Saturday Comes, which is still now, there now, which was like a, a national football ma uh, magazine. I wrote a couple of articles for them, and they just changed it totally to fit in with their house style, which is quite that was quite a good sort of uh, eye opener. Didn't think people used to do that. Um, but F Flames of the Moon was started in 1988, so uh, so it's been going a while, and there, obviously there was no websites in those days. Who are the people behind Flying to the Moon and what were they like? They've all got long hair now and beards. <laughs> <It's about laughs> um, they're all just fans and they all just saw an opportunity. Have you, they, been, <laughs> have you been cloning Kevin Wall? No, the, the, Kevin hasn't got a big beard. Yeah. There's about four of them been knocking, knocking around. They've all got beards and uh, hair, ponytails and stuff like that. It's bizarre, didn't it? At the time, they all had really short hair. Uh, just like postmen and um, and window cleaners and stuff like that. The the, the match the program that they used to be sold at the match was terrible. I had no information in it. It wasn't anything to do with it. Not, you couldn't relate to it as fans. The first fan scene was um, was two sheets of paper. Um, nobody had a staple, so they couldn't stick. It wasn't stapled together. It was done on a typewriter with a dodgy key. I think a dodgy U. So it was best to miss out any words with U in it. But there's too many words with U. So there's loads of it was so inconsistent. The front, the front page had like a sort of thing about no swearing. The back, the back of it had a, a, a word search with just like loads of bum, ass, and stuff like that. <laughs> so, yeah, there was. The, it started the way you know <laughs> the way it's gone on. So it, it spans the. So it started with, with a typewriter without staples, and it was fifty pence. And unbelievably, thousands, well, hundreds of people bought it because it was it was photocopied, and then it was reissued. But it was just ridiculous, it was crap, but loads of people bought it. And then within a year, they were printing 2,500 at a print, it's called Tease Print, that's still there over the border. Uh, so it, 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 it became like, it was really big. It was, uh, it was out selling the official programme, and uh, one of the strengths of it was there was lots of cartoonists. Uh, and until recently, I've had the same sort of cartoonists in the fanzines all over the years. And as you know, that, that, that's what people really like. The, the, it, it gives it a bit of sort of individual individuality, like all these fan scenes here, the cartoons. Good. So, uh, yeah.